Hey everybody, welcome back to class. So in the second video here of our braking system, we're gonna talk a little bit more about our wheel brakes and how they sort of work. So let's start with your disc brake assembly. There are really three main components that we're looking at here. One is going to be your rotor. So the vehicle's rotor is going to be bolted to your hub assembly or be part of your hub assembly, depending on your design. And this rotor is going to spin at wheel speed. So as fast as your wheels are spinning, your rotor is spinning. Then we're gonna have a caliper. And in most cases, the term caliper is referring to anything that sort of squeezes. And this is what your brake caliper is gonna look like. So this is a sliding design, but what we have is a large piston inside. On the back side here, we've got, um, let me try to show you. I've got a hole where a hydraulic line is gonna transfer fluid pressure into here. And that fluid, let's try that again. That fluid pressure is going to push a piston out or allow it to return when the fluid pressure uh, goes down. So when I press my piston out, what we're gonna do is press up against a pad inside of the caliper. Now this pad has wearable material on it. That way we don't have metal on metal grinding and we don't destroy our rotors. So my caliper is going to squeeze two pads up against the rotor to create friction to slowly stop this rotor while stopping this. The, the rotor is going to stop your wheel hub assembly, which is going to stop your wheel. So your disc brakes are spinning and when you step on the brake pedal, you are applying hydraulic pressure to our caliper and our caliper is gonna squeeze some brake pads up against our rotor to create friction to stop it. It's sort of a, um, well, any design for your brakes is going to have friction at its base. That's how we stop the car, is by utilizing friction to transfer kinetic energy into a heat energy because energy has to go somewhere right we don't just stop the car without creating something so your brakes are going to take that movement energy that kinetic energy and through friction we are going to transfer that energy into a heat energy to stop the car so that's how your disc brake works in a nutshell so um, the cool thing about disc brakes is because of a special seal um, on your, I don't have one in here, but there would be a seal inside of my caliper here that is going to allow this piston to want to return if hydraulic pressure is, is going down. So if I increase my hydraulic pressure, it pushes out the piston. When the hydraulic pressure goes down, the piston recedes back in and we pull our brake pads away from our rotor. Now, Without getting too into detail, because I talk more about this in a brakes class, your rotors can come in different designs. This is what we call a floating rotor, meaning once I pull my wheel off, if I pull my caliper off of the uh, assembly, I can actually just usually pull the rotor right off. Because um, you can see here, we've got four holes where our lug studs will slide into. Your wheel hub assembly will be behind that. Some rotors are what we call fixed instead of floating. And a fixed rotor has its own lug studs because inside of the fixed rotor is your hub assembly. It has wheel bearings and everything. So um, please excuse this rotor, it's seen better days. But I can see I've got my wheel bearing inside of here as well. So I have my hub assembly is incorporated into my fixed rotor. Another thing to sort of note about rotors is that you can buy performance rotors that have either uh, cross drilling in them. You see these holes, that's called cross drilling. These slots, uh, or I'm sorry, these sort of cutouts with the lines, those are called slots. Um, so you can get drilled and or slotted rotors. Why would you want to do that, you say? Some people will say, oh, it's to duts to allow air to go through the rotor to cool down the rotor. That's actually not the case. And in fact, if anything, these holes will create areas uh, of weak points where we get cracking in between the holes 
because it has less material to dissipate heat. So it has nothing to do necessarily with the cooling. There are arguments about there being more surface area, but for the most part, these holes are not for cooling. In fact, they are for another kind of brake fade that we call gas fade, and we'll talk about that in a few slides here. The slotting is for the same thing. Slotting or cross drilling is not for cooling. It's for any type of gas fade or water fade um, in case your brakes overheat. Again, I'll talk about that here in a slide or two. But that is fixed rotors versus floating rotors, um, drilled versus slotted. What about your drum brake assemblies? So your drum brake assembly works a little bit differently. Instead of squeezing in, we're gonna press out. So I've got a drum brake assembly right here. And instead of having a caliper, we have a wheel cylinder up here. And before I get to that, let's look at that wheel cylinder. So much like the caliper, I've got a hole on the back for a hydraulic line. So when you press on the brake pedal, you engage the piston inside of the master cylinder, which is gonna create a hydraulic pressure in the fluid, which will transfer down a brake line, which will transfer down to this sucker right here and or a caliper. Now, when I get hydraulic pressure through here, you can see that hole behind it as well. Um, I am going to press out two pistons that I have here. And those pistons are gonna wanna push out We've got rubber cup seals in here so the fluid stays in here and doesn't accidentally leak out. These two uh, rubber pieces on the outside are what we call, this one's not very good shape, but it's what we call dust boots so we don't get any dust or debris inside where our pistons are at because our pistons are not sort of perfect sliding up against our cylinder walls here. So this fluid pressure is going to increase pressure in here, press out pistons out to move toward the outside so if we're looking at this diagram here, inside our wheel cylinder are the same pistons that we all know and love that we just saw. Those pistons are gonna press out and we are going to press out these brake shoes. So you can see right here and right here look like they have pad material on them because they do. Those are friction surfaces that are, again are going to create friction. So what is spinning at wheel speed? Because this is not. All of this is mounted up against your backing plate, your wheel cylinder, your, uh, your shoes. So you've got this drum that has holes in it, much like your floating rotors. And this drum on the inside has a nice smooth surface, kind of like your brake rotor does, but it's on the inside. And this drum is going to sit on top over my drum brake assembly. So as my drum is spinning at wheel speed, when I want to apply my brakes, hydraulic pressure goes through our wheel cylinder, presses out our shoes, and our shoes will press out against the drum to create friction to stop the vehicle. So it's a little bit more of a complicated process with the drum brake. Something has to pull our shoes back in, so we have to have springs, a return springs that are gonna pull our shoes back in. And these are not self-adjusting like your disc brakes are, so we're going to have some sort of adjuster, like a star wheel adjuster down here, that is going to need to be adjusted from time to time as well. Your parking brake, as I mentioned before, is 100% mechanically operated, has nothing to do with your hydraulic system. Your parking brake is not an emergency brake, at least that's not what it was designed to, uh, to be. You can, I suppose, use it as an emergency brake, but it's designed to be a parking brake, which means it's designed to hold the vehicle at a stop once it's already been stopped. Um, the parking brake can be uh, electromechanically operated, as I mentioned, if you've got a button to engage your parking brake. Um, then it's going to be electronically operated, but it's still going to be mechanical in nature. While all the other designs are pretty much a straight mechanical lever or pedal of some sort. And it will require some adjustment over a period of time because those cables have a tendency to stretch. So the brake balance control subsystem in your braking system is going to consist of two main valves. One is going to be a metering valve, the other is going to be a proportioning valve. So if we're looking at the system here, here's our master cylinder. We've seen this before in the previous slides. 
we are going through what we call a brake warning light switch. That's not necessarily part of the brake balance control, but that brake light warning switch is going to detect a pressure drop in one system or the other. And if it detects a pressure drop, there's going to be a piece that moves from one side or the other, and it's going to turn on your brake warning light, your red brake warning light. So if you have a hydraulic failure in one of the circuits, it is going to let you know that you have a problem and it'll pop on your red brake warning light. But I'll tell you, you won't need the red brake warning light to let you know that there's a problem because you're gonna feel it in your brake pedal big time. Now, as far as the brake balance control goes, if you go through this here, from our brake light warning switch, we go to a metering valve and on the other side, we go to a proportioning valve. So let me sort of break that down briefly. Um, in, a, in, in the most basic form, a metering valve is a timing valve. A metering valve, as you can see, is in the front, in your canvas, you can probably see it a little bit better here, um, but it says disc brake front. So these are my two disc brakes up at the front. My metering valve is going to delay my front brakes, and here's why. If I'm driving in my car, when I go to step on the brakes, um, if I, let's say, I only engage my front brakes, I am going to get a massive nosedive. If you've ever ridden a motorcycle, you know this. If you only use your front brake, a lot of the weight wants to go toward the front. So if you utilize your front and your rear brake when you come to a stop, it's a nice level stop. Um, your rear brake doesn't work quite as well as your front brake because remember, we're only doing 30% of your braking in the rear. However, on systems where we have a rear drum brake. Remember our drum brake that I talked about a few slides ago? So our rear drum brake has all these components and we're gonna have to push our wheel cylinder out, which is gonna push out our shoes up against the drum. Now here's the problem with this. This takes a little bit longer than your caliper squeezing up against a rotor. So what we don't want is to engage your front brakes before our rears engage. So on systems where we have a front disc setup and a rear drum setup, we will have a metering valve to delay our front brakes to give our rear brakes a chance to engage and then our front brakes can engage. So really they're engaging around the same time. We're delaying the fronts to give a chance for our rear brakes to engage. You only need a metering valve if you have rear drum brakes. You don't need a metering valve if you have all four disc brakes, just FYI. Now every car is going to have what we call a proportioning valve. The proportioning valve is going to a little bit be the opposite. Instead of controlling the front, it's controlling the rear, but it's not a timing valve. It is controlling how much pressure is going to go to your rear. So a proportioning valve is going to proportion a certain amount of brake hydraulic pressure to the rear. Um, and on certain vehicles, it'll be a load sensing proportioning valve, um, like on trucks. On certain trucks, uh, F1, uh, Ford used this on some of their trucks, Toyota used this on some of their pickups as well. A load sensing proportioning valve is going to change the amount of brake pressure in the rear depending on how much weight is sitting inside of the rear bed of the vehicle, causing it to sort of lower. On any regular vehicle, we're going to have the same um, sort of set up, if you will, meaning that a certain percentage of brake pressure is going to go to the front and a certain percentage of brake pressure is going to go to the rear. Now this can depend on the vehicle, how much weight is distributed from the front to the rear, so on and so forth. So um, there's not necessarily a straight percentage across the board that all vehicles put to the front and to the rear, but your proportioning valve is going to put as much as needed to your rear. So if your proportioning valve, um, let's say, you want to race your vehicle and you want more rear brake for whatever reason, um, you can buy an adjustable proportioning valve where you can adjust the amount of rear brake pressure uh, to have more pressure or to have less pressure. Now, in a lot of vehicles, we'll take your metering valve and your proportioning valve and your brake light warning switch and we'll put them all in one and they'll call it a combination switch or a combo switch. So if you ever see that term, it's referring to all of those valves in one. At the very least, it will be your proportioning and your metering valve, but your combo switch or your combo valve is going to contain more than one valve in there. So that is your brake balance control. All right, as far as your brake warning lights go, we're gonna have two. 
One is your red brake warning light. Now, in terms of just basic knowledge, if you come to a traffic light and it's red, it usually means stop, right? So your red brake warning light means that you should probably stop and figure out what's going on with your brakes. At the very least, test your brake pedal to make sure that you still have brakes. So there is a couple of things that can cause your red brake warning light to turn on. First, your parking brake. Now, if you're driving and you're at a high speed, like a freeway speed, don't look at your parking brake and say, oh, I left my parking brake on and disengage it right away. It will cause your vehicle to maneuver very oddly. So slow down and then disengage your parking brake. Try not to leave your parking brake on ever because it's going to wear out your brakes um, in a really funky way. Um, I don't recommend it. Always check your brake light to make sure that it's not on. If your red brake warning light's on, A, your parking brake could be the cause. B, the second cause could be low fluid. Remember that sensor in your reservoir? That sensor in your reservoir in the master cylinder is going to let you know if your brake fluid is low. Because if you have low brake fluid, if we get too low, there will suck air into the system, or, or air will get sucked into the system. And what you'll have is um, essentially a really spongy pedal. If you have any pedal, if we get air, too much air sucked into our master cylinder. So the red brake warning light can come on for either of those reasons. The third reason is going to be some sort of hydraulic failure. Remember that brake light warning switch I was telling you about? Yeah, so if we have too much pressure drop in one circuit, let's say the front circuit or the rear circuit or in a diagonal split circuit, um, one of the two circuits loses hydraulic pressure, that brake light warning switch, is gonna turn on your red brake warning light. Now, if you know that your brake warning switch is good, your brake pedal feels fine, haven't lost any hydraulic pressure, you checked your brake fluid, enough brake fluid is, it, the brake fluid is at the max in your reservoir, and you've checked your parking brake, and your parking brake is in fact not on. There's gonna be some sort of electrical fault in one of those systems that's causing the brake light warning light to stay on. Um, and that's sort of common. Um, it can be in the brake light warning switch in the cluster. It could be uh, the brake light warning switch itself is just bad and it's sort of shorted and so it's causing the light to turn on. Um, there's a number of things. It could be the switch in your parking brake lever. So you're putting your parking brake down, your lever's not engaged, but the switch itself is bad and so it thinks that it's on. So there's a number of electrical faults that can happen. We can go over that in an electrical class um, or even a brakes class actually. Now, the other light is going to be an amber warning light for your ABS system. I'll get into ABS here in a moment, but know that if your ABS light is on, your ABS system, your anti-lock braking system, and probably your traction control will not function because it means that there is a error in the system. However, I will let you know that an amber ABS light is not going to affect your brakes, your service brakes at all. Um, now, if you get a light where you've got the red brake warning light and the ABS light on, that means one of two things. You have an integrated ABS module um, into, uh, you, you've got some sort of integrated ABS into your power brake system with your master cylinder and something has failed, or your ABS module has failed or it has a bad ground, so it's throwing both the lights on. Either way, it's probably an electronic problem, not so much necessarily a brakes problem, but if you've got the ABS light on, your ABS will not work, meaning your wheels will lock up, your traction control will not work. So just FYI for your brake light, uh, your, your brake warning lights. Your brake lights themselves are engaged via the brake switch. The brake light switch is really simple. It's pretty much mostly located in, in the same place on a lot of vehicles, which is right behind your brake pedal. So when you step on the brake pedal, it engages your brake light switch, which is gonna turn on your brake lights, which by the way, um, by law, you're supposed to have three of them. So if one of them is out, you can get pulled over by a police officer and cited. So be careful of that. Brake fade is a term that we use when your brakes don't work. <laughs> You step on the brake pedal and nothing happens. So there are five types of fade that we're looking at. 
We're looking at water fade. You go through a big old puddle and you tsunami somebody because you think it's funny and instant karma happens. Water gets in between your pad and the rotor um, or the shoe and the drum, which by the way, I should have mentioned probably uh, made, made more of a talking point on. Your, your disc brakes use pads. Your drum brakes use shoes. Don't interchange those terms because the people at the parts store might laugh at you if they know. Um, sorry to anybody who works at AutoZone or O'Reilly, but you know your coworkers. So, water fade is when water gets in between our friction surface and our pad or shoe material, meaning I can't create friction, meaning I can't stop. That's water fade. Um, by the way, your drilled or slotted rotors can resist water fade because water is going to move through these holes and get pushed through those holes rather than get stuck in between your pad and the rotor. The next one is what we call hydraulic fade. Hydraulic fade is where the fluid, remember I talked about your brake fluid um, in the last video and I said that you don't want that fluid to boil because air will compress and fluid does not? Well, that's hydraulic fade. Maybe you didn't change your brake fluid often enough and it just has too much water in it and it boils or maybe you're racing and you're using stock fluid like a DOT3 fluid with a low boiling point and your fluid fails, meaning the fluid will boil, it aerates, and you're going to get a really spongy pedal. That is hydraulic fade. If uh, you pump the brake pedal, that may help. Um, but the fluid is boiling and it's going to need to calm, uh, it, it's going to need to calm down. No, the fluid is going to need to cool down. As far as lining fade goes, lining fade is when we're using a brake pad and the pad material or shoe, like I said, if we're looking at a drum brake, your shoe looks something like this. They both have material on them to create friction. When this material gets too hot for what it was made for, it will smooth out and essentially not create any friction at all. Therefore, you're not going to stop the vehicle. Remember, we need friction in order to stop the vehicle. So lining fade is when the brake shoe or the pad has overheated beyond its capacity. Pumping the brakes is not necessarily going to help. They need to cool down. So there's not really much you can do. And the scary part is, is when these overheat, your brake pedal feels completely normal. It, feel, it doesn't feel spongy. It feels exactly like it normally does, except you don't stop. So that's a little bit scary. Um, the only thing you can do is uh, try to, you can try to use your parking brake but uh, you, you need to let these brakes cool down. So it's really not a good idea if you're going down a really steep grade to be on riding your brakes a whole lot because you can get lining fade real easy, especially with cheap pads. Now, the fourth one is what we call gas fade. Gas fade doesn't really exist near as much anymore, and here's what it is, um, and here's why. So back in the day, um, certain types of pads would... Um, be riveted to this backing plate here. This is a metal backing plate. You guys can see, so this is the pad material. This is the backing plate. The, the pad material would either be riveted or glued to this backing plate. So if we glued the pad to the backing plate, what would happen is your brakes would get really hot and that glue would start to create a gas and that gas would create a barrier in between your rotor and your pad. That gas would prevent friction from happening, um, and again, your brakes would not work. Your brake pedal feels completely normal, but you're not stopping. So again, drilled and slotted rotors really came in play when we had problems with gas fade. That gas could escape in these little holes, and we could provide friction again and stop the vehicle. We don't have gas fade anymore. We got rid of that problem. We use different glues now, and those glues don't create gas. So what are those cross drillings for? Maybe if you're going to get water fade. Um, but to be honest, if you're really concerned with water fade or gas fade, get rotors that are slotted. Here's why. The cross drilling creates weak points in the rotor. It actually is not as good necessarily for cooling uh, because it has less metal to dissipate the heat. And so they'll overheat and warp uh, a little faster. They will cause cracking a little faster. Um, the only real benefit is to resist that fade. Well, here's the thing. These slots, 
those slots do the same thing without any of the drawbacks, without any of the cracking and any of that. And we still get to keep rotor material. So if you're really in the market for some performance rotors, get slotted rotors rather than cross drilling. If you really like the look of cross drilling, by all means, you do you, boo. Now the last one is what we call mechanical fade and mechanical fade only happens on drum brakes. Mechanical fade is when my drum itself gets too hot and it expands. So as my shoes are pushing up against the inside of my drum surface here, my drum gets really hot and is malleable and it sort of spreads open and expands open. Well, that's a problem. There's not really much you can do about that. That happens a lot when you um, let, well, any type of overheating. So if you're riding your brakes on a really steep grade or anything like that. So mechanical fade only happens on drum brakes because if my rotor was to do the same thing, if my rotor was in fact to expand, it would actually get closer to the pad and would actually break more than what you would want rather than less than what you would want. So that's brake fade in a nutshell. If you ever hear the term brake fade, it simply means that the brakes are not working. Now the last thing I want to talk about is your anti-lock braking system and or traction control. The anti-lock braking system is your ABS. ABS uses wheel speed sensors at each four wheel. And it's monitoring the wheel speed at all four of those wheels. So let's say your two front wheels are uh, at 35 miles an hour, your rear left wheel is 35 miles an hour, but your right rear wheel and let's say is at 20 miles an hour, we know that there is slip going on with that right rear wheel. So what your ABS does is it will, uh, in meaning slip, meaning that there's locking up in that wheel. So your ABS is actually going to disengage the brake for you and it's going to pulse the brake really, really fast, really, really fast. Um, your, your ABS system is simply engaging, disengaging, engaging, disengaging, engaging, engaging, disengaging, super, super, multiple times per second. It's super, super fast. I think it's like 15 times per second. In fact, now with newer systems, I guarantee it's more than that. So it is able to pulse the brake pressure if you just simply give all the pressure you can to your brakes, you're gonna lock up. There is such a thing as too much braking. Some of you guys have experienced this. Your ABS, when it sees your wheels locking up and skidding, is going to release the brake pressure so your wheels can spin, then it's going to apply the brakes again. Release, apply, release, apply. So your wheels are able to still spin as you're rolling. Now this sounds a little counterproductive because you're trying to stop the car. The problem with is if you don't have ABS and your wheels are locking up as you're trying to stop, you have zero directional control and you are just going to plow straight through no matter which direction you turn your wheels in. ABS will stop the car almost as fast as locking up the wheels, but you're also going to maintain directional control. So you can see in this picture here, without ABS, we locked up our wheels and we ran straight through the cone. With ABS, it's uh, slip grip, slip grip, slip grip, and we still maintain control to be able to maneuver around that cone. Now, um, your traction control utilizes ABS most of the time. Your traction control is going to utilize the wheel speed sensors that your ABS uses, and while normal driving, let's say you're not even applying the brake, if we're, we've got wheel slippage, we're able to utilize the ABS system to sort of work around and engage individual brakes um, on four wheel setups where I've got uh, pretty much individual solenoids for all four wheels. I'm able with my ABS system to engage individual wheels to prevent slip in any given direction. So your traction control a lot of times uses your ABS. We'll get a lot more into this in a brakes class. So I just wanted to briefly go over it and to really clarify because this is a common mistake. A ABS is anti-lock braking system, not anti-braking system. So with that, if you guys have any questions at all, please make sure you put them in the comments or send me an email or a message through Canvas and I will get back to you as soon as I can. I will see you guys in this week's Zoom session.